Greetings, Ohio Valley. This is Dan Lima with OSU Extension from Belmont County. And this is Karen Cox from WVU Extension in Ohio County. Thanks for tuning in to Extension Calling, your source for research-based information for the farm, garden, and home. Hey, we just wanted to say thank you to everyone who has sent us an evaluation. That information is so very important. We are still looking for feedback from our listeners. So if there's a show that you've listened to that has really helped you, then please feel free to go ahead and fill out that evaluation again and just let us know how you're using the information for the show. Yeah, let us know how our show is helping you, whether it's a major thing, whether it's a little gold nugget you're able to get out of it. We try to mix a lot of our uh, experiences with the show and just want to know how it helps you out. You can fill out these evaluations as many times as you want. And also, you can use those evaluations to tell us if there's a topic that you would like us to address. So we do welcome that. And we're always looking for new ideas on things that you feel are important. So let us know what you want to learn from our show. You can find the evaluation online at https colon forward slash forward slash B-I-T dot L-Y extension calling evaluation. And that is H-T-T-P-S colon forward slash forward slash bit.ly. So that's B-I-T dot L-Y extension calling evaluation and extension calling and evaluation all need to be capitalized. But those are the only caps you need to worry about. Or you can just call us at the office. You can reach me at 304-234-3673. That's 304-234-3673. And you can also contact me at 740-695-1455. That's 740-695-1455. Hello, Karen. Hey, Dan. Today we got a pretty novel topic and happy Easter to everybody. Yeah, we did a show a couple years back about, you know, so you got peeps for Easter that weren't candy. You know, what do you do with it? And we talked about uh, entry level chicken care. And so today we figured we'd do entry level rabbit care. And this program has been supported by your 4-H resource handbook for me. You know, these 4-H resource books, Karen and I were talking about this, but they're just really good information, you know, not just for projects, but, you know, unlike, I guess, unlike Ag and Natural Resources, maybe some other program areas, I want to say there's probably a 4-H office in every single county. So not terribly hard to come by, but these books are great. They really give you a lot of insight. They're written well, and I mean, they're meant, they're meant for kids, but... <laughs> I'm using it, right? Well, one of the things we'd love to encourage you to do is if your child desperately wants a rabbit, to enroll them in 4-H and help them, you know, have them get a project guide. And that guide will walk them through the steps they need to properly care for the animal. And in some counties, they could even take that rabbit to show to the fair. And it should be recognized, though, that a lot of times when we're talking rabbits from an agricultural perspective, we're talking about meat rabbits. So rabbits to be eaten and not necessarily for pets. But a lot of the care is the same, just different breeds typically and also different feeding. But the same thing is are going to apply. So when we're thinking rabbits, depending on the type of rabbit you have, you can have a lot of different uses for that rabbit, right? So you could have a rabbit for breeding stock where your whole goal of having a rabbit is to have more rabbit. And we've all heard the breeding like bunnies, right? But you can also raise rabbits to eat. They are very healthy meat and they can be raised in a very small area. So it could be a very useful way to add meat to your diet. You can also raise them for fur. Rabbit fur is very soft and a lot of rabbits are raised simply for their fur. You can also raise rabbits for wool. There are Angora rabbits and you can collect that wool and use it for 
making other products. And of course, we've all know about laboratory rabbits and of course, pets, right? So some people just want a rabbit for companionship and there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. And, you know, there's no reason for raising a fur. You can't eat the meat as well. I, I think rabbit meat is much more common in Europe than it is in the United States. But, you know, some people do eat it. Like Karen said, it's it's a red meat. It's pretty lean. It doesn't take a whole lot of space to raise rabbits. But there are quite a bit of breeds. I think there's like 50. Yeah, you'll find rabbits that have like the red eyes, which is albinoism, which means the rabbit's not making any pigment. So you'll get like a white fur, white wool or a non-pigmented meat. Yeah, you were talking about rabbit meat in Europe, and it was very common in the United States for a while, but it has fallen out of fashion. I think it's because they're just cute little snuggly things and we like pets here. I don't know. But my brother's friend had a rabbit named Peter Hausenpfeffer, which I have always found hilarious because Hausenpfeffer is a German dish of rabbit. <laughs> and so, you know, just like how people name their pigs bacon and <laughs> things like that, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We all we all knew that one, Karen. I don't think that's common knowledge. <laughs> how do you say it? Hausenpfeffer? Hausenpfeffer. Haas and Pfeffer. Haas and Pfeffer. <laughs> Sounds delicious. <laughs> I have honestly never had Haas and Pfeffer. I have had a rabbit. I have a glorious picture of my kids when they were little. We were at an event and one of our friends cooked rabbit for the event. And they're so excited to be eating a rabbit. I think my younger son was like four and my older son was probably six, seven. And it was just, a, they were not happy. <laughs> well, my, the, the first time I had rabbit was in Europe. I was an exchange student. This was back in the late 90s, was in 97. Long, long time ago. <laughs> and um, I remember we, I had a friend who, you know, so... With exchange programs, you know, people kind of get placed in different areas of the country. And this, in my case, was Italy. And I had a friend from Finland that was placed in a very rural family in Italy. And she invited me over to hang out with her and her family. And that day they were they were harvesting rabbits. So I got to help out with that. We cleaned them up and had rabbits that day. So it was. It was good. I I really enjoyed it. They made it into like a a stew, I think, if I remember right. So, you know, we talk about rabbits for meat. A rabbit is roughly maybe 10 pounds. And that's, you know, that's that's not the meat that you're getting. You're not getting 10 pounds of meat out of it. But the rabbit itself will be on average about 10 pounds. Um, And as far as a pen goes, the recommendation is 36 by 30 inches to provide adequate space for rabbit. So basically three by three, just under for a 10 pound animal. They're recommending keeping them away from loud noises, having some kind of access to natural light, even if it's just through a window is fine. For disease control, you want to make sure there's good ventilation so it's not damp. You know, you're giving them food and water. And as far as uh, water, clean water, we always talk about, no matter what animal we talk about, you know, water is going to be one of the most important things to give to an animal clean water is the most important nutrient there is but in order to provide clean water you might think of a bowl of sorts or the bottles with the um, the metal extension like this metal straw and it can just kind of lap it up give the water in a way that the animal can't really poop in it or um, you know get in it. it it helps keep the water clean so that way you're ensuring that the animal always has fresh water clean water Yeah. And even if you're using a bottle water dispenser, you still want to make sure that you're cleaning it frequently. We recommend that you clean it every couple of days with a mild bleach solution, some warm, soapy water and rinse it well, of course. But make sure you're giving the rabbits enough water. They're small animals, so you don't think they drink a lot, but a doe and her litter will drink about a gallon of water every day. So you may have to refill your bottle more than you think. It's a really good point. It's a lot of water for that little animal. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean, that's yeah, that's uh, that's pretty impressive. Some other things you want to make sure you're getting water from a good source, right? You don't want to just fill up a bottle from the creek. Again, 
water is the most important nutrient. So that clean water is going to go a long way for disease control, for animal gains, for good, for well-being. Nesting boxes, you know, if you're if you're breeding the animal, making sure that they have an area where the rabbit can actually give birth and nurse the bunnies. But also just kind of making sure you're keeping the, the cage clean. You got it. You have to stay on top of it. Like Karen said, you know, a lot of times if it's an unexpected gift, because we, you know, this is kind of the when when things like that happen around Easter, because that's what we think of. We think of bunnies. But you have to make sure that you're not neglecting the animal. You want to make sure that the animal's healthy and being cared for. So making sure that it has a clean cage, good water, quality food. It's all important. And then I think ventilation is one of those things that might not get it's not, it might not be as obvious, but a lot of respiratory diseases can happen with poor ventilation, no matter what the animal. So just make sure that there's good airflow in there. That's not too muggy if you're keeping it in a basement or something. And again, it'll be good for the rabbit to be able to have some kind of light, whether it's through a window or if you're taking it outside, even in the cage or something. Just for its well-being, but also for like the circadian clock. You know, these animals, we do the same thing. We respond to light and it, it is kind of our circadian clock and it'll help the animal rest. It'll help with appetite and, you know, it'll just help make the animal just be in better, better, uh, better general health. Yeah. Right. And so when you're thinking about their living environment, you know, they can be indoor or outdoor. You can have an outdoor hutch for rabbits. That's fine. But if they're going to be outside, yes, they want that sunlight, but you also have to provide them adequate shade. So they do need to be able to get out of the sun. And also, if it's really hot, you need to be able to provide them an opportunity to cool off. So, for instance, if it is really hot, you could put a frozen jug of water in the cage with them and it'll act as a little air conditioner around them or you could take some wet towels and put them on the sides of the cage and turn a fan on so that it helps that water evaporate and that evaporation is going to again act as an air conditioning system so that can help cool your rabbit down in the summertime so you have to think about the full lifespan of this animal and they can live um what 12 years seems like a good life for rabbit (laughs) (laughs) it's hard because you know oftentimes we talk to people about rabbits we're talking about market rabbits and you know you can have a rabbit as young as eight weeks that you're preparing to have as a fryer and uh, your roasters are going to be under five months and so a lot of times when we're talking from an agricultural perspective we're not really thinking about the full lifespan yeah and just a little bit more on some rabbit physiology So rabbits are a monogastric herbivore. They have similar bacteria that uh, a lot of ruminant animals have similar. They can't necessarily break down the fiber percentages that something like cattle, sheep and goats can, even horses. They're going to rely a lot on some lower fiber digestibility. So 14 percent. Yeah. And 15 to 18 percent protein. But as far as feed goes. They're going to require proteins, carbohydrates, and fats, and minerals. You can get mineral supplements for rabbits, but as far as making sure that they have an adequate balance of nutrients, you know, just like, you know, a dog or a cat, you you buy ration food, pelletized food. So they do make specialized food for rabbits that does encompass their diet, the limitations of their gut. So that they are putting on the weight that you want, you know, whether you're actually raising it for meat, for a pet, you know, you want to make sure that they have the overall nutrition that they need for proper function. Consult a vet if you have any questions or even, you know, somebody that specializes in animal nutrition, you know, sometimes they're available. Make sure that it's rated for rabbits, but also don't forget minerals because, they're you know, they're going to need minerals as well, just like we need vitamins. Yeah. And plus fresh hay and grain can also be good for your rabbits. It's perfectly fine to let your pet rabbit uh, hop around in your yard as long as they're protected and they're not going to have an opportunity to escape, of course, and eat the grass from your yard as long as it's 
not treated with pesticides, but um, that is perfectly fine and healthy for your rabbits. They typically like uh, some of that fresh green. And so making sure that you're providing that can also help improve their digestion. And right. And and I just I'm just trying to keep it a little bit simple, you know, just in case it's somebody's first time, you know, they they do make rabbit food, you know, that, like balance rations specifically for rabbits. So you don't have to, you know, necessarily look a bunch of things up and calculate. Oh, yeah. One of the things you want to look for is the feces of the rabbit and whether or not they look normal. So you want them to be in a, in a tight pellet. You don't want it to be soft or mucousy. Or runny. Those are things that could be yeah, indications that you're either the balance is of their diet is off or that they may have a an illness. And, and you want to make sure to keep that animal healthy, you know, disease can be something that can affect that. So check on that, check on that animal, make sure it's clean. It has a clean cage. You know, if you are starting to see problems like that, call a vet. If you do have an animal that gets sick, you don't want to consume a sick animal. Okay. So keep that in mind, you know, especially if you're, if you're raising it for meat purposes, the way we kind of talked about earlier, um, you want to make sure at the time of harvest that the animal is healthy because you don't want to consume a diseased animal, no matter what the species, you know, that's just, that's just good practice. Right. And when you are looking at how to maintain the health of your rabbit, one of the things you're going to look for is just like a body condition score that we recommend for cattle. And basically, you're going to run your hands over the skin, feeling the rib area and the backbone. And, you know, if you can feel the ribs easily and the backbone, then it needs to eat more, give it more food. Uh, and if you can't, then maybe it's a little too much and you need to lay off a little bit of the food. So just like in humans, having an overweight rabbit is unhealthy for the animal. It puts extra pressure and uh, stress on the heart and the lungs and the other organs. So it can make your animal unhappy. So you do want to make sure that you're feeding it an adequate amount as well as the adequate type of food. Right. That balanced ration, you know, that you can get. And there's different ways to feed rabbits, too. They could have access to as much food as they want. But Karen's right. If they start getting too big, you might have to start controlling how much feed they have access to to make sure that you have a rabbit that has the proper body weight, fat to muscle ratio that makes the, 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 the meat quality better. And it'll also make the health of the, the rabbit better as well. Right. And, you know, just like you're going to be cleaning the water bottle, you want to clean the food bowl as well. You also want to make sure that they are consuming all of the food you're giving them in a day. So for those freshly weaned kits, as they're starting to forage out and eat their own food, they get as much as they want. Just any growing child, get, eat, 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 right? A manja, manja, you're too skinny, right? There we go. That's, that sounds like the rabbit I had. <laughs> <laughs> but as far as the adults, you know, as we get older, we age, our metabolism slows down. Rabbits are the same and they would need a more restrictive diet. So don't let a mature adult rabbit eat as much as you gave it uh, as when it was ravenously growing. So you don't want your, your rabbit to be overweight. You also want to make sure that you're cleaning that cage regularly. Like Dan had said about uh, ventilation, that's really critical, but also making sure that you're not allowing their waste to build up because that can release ammonia and that again can cause breathing conditions and make them ill. So you do want to make sure that you are providing the proper location for, you, for your bunny. Yeah. And you can smell, if you're starting to smell ammonia, Chances are the ventilation's not good or you're not cleaning enough. So just make sure that it shouldn't be difficult for you to breathe. And that animal is a lot smaller than you and its face is a lot lower to the ground. So if the, an the animal is going to have even a harder time if you're having a hard time breathing. Um, so, so keep that in mind. You know, if, if it just seems uncomfortable for you, it's probably more uncomfortable for the animal. Right. And let's talk a little bit about caring for the animal itself, keeping it clean. You have the external organs on a rabbit. You'll have your ears, your eyes, your nose and the nails. Oh, and the feet. 
the nails, just like a cat or a dog, are continuously growing and you do have to cut them or clip them on a regular basis. If you don't, the toes could get malformed. So you want to use a similar nail clipper like you would for a cat or a dog. But again, just like them, you don't want to cut into the quick or the living tissue that's under that nail. So don't go back too far. The nose should be dry always. One of the most certain signs of disease is a runny nose. And so wheezing or a snuffling sound when you're listening to their chest could be an infection. And so... You want to have good ventilation, but you don't want them to have a draft. So if there is a cold draft, then that could make them sick. The eye should be bright and attentive. You don't want them to be kind of a dull. That's usually a sign of poor health or old age. If they're leaky or discharging, it's definitely a sign that the rabbit is sick. And finally, your ears and your feet. Check the rabbit's feet pretty regularly. Make sure there's no dirt accumulating between their toes. And then also check the ears and look inside them to be sure if they need to be cleaned. You can use a a gentle wipe, a little cloth with a little bit of olive oil or baby oil, or, you know, even a cotton swab could be used to just clean out any yucky stuff that has uh, collected in the ear. Yeah. And check the ears for infections and stuff like that. Rabbits seem to get colds just like we do and to get runny noses, but along their feet, just make sure you're not seeing any sores as well. You know, that could be an infection. That could just be irritation. And if you start seeing that, you know, look at the cage and make sure that if it's a metal cage and it's a wire cage, that their feet aren't just getting irritated by the by the wires. You don't want sores on their feet. That's just another route of infection, especially on the feet. And then again, if you have a sick animal, you do not want to consume a sick animal and you don't want to make an animal suffer either. So regular checks is a very important thing. It's one thing to just look at the animal in the cage and see how it behaves. And that can give you some clues of what might be going on. But a lot of times you're going to have to handle them. You're going to have to look in the ears, under the feet um, in places that aren't as visible. Yeah. And as you're handling your rabbit, do recognize they are light boned animals and can be easily injured. You should never pick them up by their ears. You should never pick them up by the skin on the back or on the back of the neck like you would scruff a cat. That's not good to do for a rabbit. That will injure the rabbit. You always want to make sure that you're getting your hand under the weight of the rabbit and holding the rabbit by its body. It's going to be safer for your rabbit to pick it up that way. Right. Yeah. You're not you're not going to injure the animal. All all 10 pounds of rabbit. <laughs> <laughs> and, and make sure that, you know, you recognize if you are taking your rabbit out of the home into a new situation that can be easily frightened, just like any other animal or any other person for that matter. So uh, new environments, strange noises, your typically calm and docile rabbit may totally freak out on you. And those toenails are super sharp and they can really hurt. And they do bite sometimes. So you do want to be careful. Never place a rabbit close to your face and be aware that your typically calm rabbit can become unpredictable in a new environment. That's right. And if you find that you can't take care of the animal, you know, and you you need to sell it, uh, you know, if you do, if you do sell it to somebody else as a pet specifically, just make sure that, um, you know, they, they have the adequate information, the adequate resources, it might be a good idea to sell the rabbit with the care products that you had as well. So the cage, the feeding bowls, the water, stuff like that. Just make sure that they're prepared. But please, please, please don't release it into the wild. These are not wild animals. And the eastern cottontail is very differently uh, situated to deal with a wild environment than these rabbits that we buy for breeding, showing, and for pets. So please don't just release it to the wild. If you don't know anyone that will take it, please reach out to your local extension office or your local animal shelter first and see if you can rehome it that way. And while we're talking about the wild and before we run out of time, I also want to 
distress. If you happen upon a nest of baby bunnies this year, please don't disturb it. Just leave them be. The mama rabbit will only come back about once a day to nurse the kits. So just leave them be. If their eyes are closed and they're hanging out, they're probably just fine. You can lay a couple pieces of grass across the top uh, in a tic-tac-toe pattern just to see if the mama comes back overnight because she won't go there when you're looking, let me tell you. She knows you're watching. <laughs> now, if it's, it's in a place where it's dangerous for the rabbits, you know. Well, what if, it, what if it's right next to the garden? <laughs> you're just going to have to wait because unless you're going <laughs> to remove them through lethal means, you are going to probably, as you move them, it will disturb them and they'll probably die anyway. Do not ever pick up a wild rabbit, even if they're only four inches long, little teeny tiny things. If their eyes are open and they're alert and their ears are up, they are perfectly fine on their own. They're doing their thing. That's rabbits mature much more quickly than humans those little tiny babies will do just fine if you find a baby bird you can put it back in the nest unless it's trying to learn to fly and hopping all over the place and just leave it be the mama's going to come back and take care of it just let those wild animals be wild animals okay all right and we are out of time so thanks so much for listening Thanks for listening to Extension Calling. This show is a collaboration between OSU Belmont County Extension Educator Dan Lima and WVU Ohio County Extension Agent Karen Cox. If you'd like a transcript of this show, contact us at the office. Also, let us know if you enjoy the show by ranking us on your podcast app.